Well, good morning and welcome to the worship service at Bethany Lutheran Church in Vacaville, California. I'm Pastor Phil Pledger. I am the newly installed pastor. Uh, the congregation, by and large, hasn't met me. Some of the leaders, of course, have, and I'm so looking forward to getting to know every single member of Bethany Lutheran Church. Our order of worship today is printed out, as you'll see on the screen, and uh, we begin our, our worship with our first song called All of Creation. quickly sped, he rises glorious from the dead, all glory to our risen head, alleluia, alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen and dead. Even as we glory in the gift of eternal life, in that hope we spend our days in joyful repentance and faith, let us confess our sin, the sin that so easily besets us, and receive the full forgiveness our Lord daily provides for us. Lord God, God, though the strife is over, the battle done, done and, and now is the victor's triumph won, sin still hangs on. We are your baptized people. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us into our Easter joy. 
Upon this your confession, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant to the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
in the world is all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name. Jesus Christ, Son of the Father and our eternal Savior, hear the prayers of your people, especially for our deliverance when called to suffer for your sake. Deliver us and all of our persecutors from the just judgment of our sins and receive us into the eternal mansions prepared for us. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The first reading is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Helianistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles, who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose. However, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. To this he replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The glory of God appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels but have not obeyed it. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, 
looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The epistle reading is taken from 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 2. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, to, be God. to God. Hi friends. So let's talk about something fun, going on a trip. I don't know about you, but I am so ready to go on vacation. I just want to get away from my house or from work, just go somewhere like the beach or the mountains, just have a nice relaxing time with my family or my friends. But hmm, if I want to go somewhere, I need directions on where to go. Did you know that we used to have to use maps and it was like pieces of paper and they would come in big books and it would tell us how to get somewhere. You'd have to be really good at reading them. So I have this map here and it would tell me where to go. So I would need to turn right onto this street and then go to Yellow Street and then turn left and then go two more streets and turn right. Yeah, Miss Nat, she, she's not so good at reading maps. So I'm really thankful that we have GPSs in our car and even more so on our phones to tell us where to go when we need to get somewhere. And then it's someone telling you. So you could be driving, I could be not fully paying attention, and then a voice comes on and says, turn right in 100 feet. And then it makes it a little easier to follow to get where I want to go. Hmm, but that makes me think, you know what would be really nice is if there was a GPS for how to follow Jesus and how to get where he wants us to go. Now, there's not really one that we can do like on our phones or in our cars. But did you know that if we do our Bible book and we read it, we can find that Jesus tells us how to get to where we need to go, to heaven, to live with him forever. In fact, in John, in chapter 14, in verse 6, Jesus even tells the disciples, 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one gets to the Father except through me. Hmm. I wonder what that means. That means that Jesus is saying that if we believe that he came to earth and died for us on the cross and that he rose again, which we know he did, that if we believe that all that is true in our hearts, then we get to be with him forever in heaven. Isn't that so cool? So our Bible book is kind of like a big map for our life. It has all these stories in it and words from Jesus and from his disciples that tells us what to do and where to go and how to get there in a different way than a map would. It might not say, well, Miss Natalie, you need to go down this road and over here and there you'll find a person to help. No, it doesn't give directions like that, but it does give us directions on how to be kind to our neighbors and our friends and our classmates or what we can do to go out and tell people about Jesus, because that's the best news ever, is to go share with anybody who hasn't known Jesus. Say, hey, look at our best friend, Jesus. He does all these amazing things and helps us. And we can find out how to do that from our Bible. So cool. So let's see. Let's pray. Fold your hands. Dear Lord, thank you so much for coming to earth, for dying for us, for rising again and making a home in heaven for us to be with you forever. Lord, thank you for giving us your Bible so that we can follow the maps in it to know the way to get to you, believe in you, and that way we can be in heaven. Please have us, let us have a blessed week and a day ahead. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, friends. Hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you, Natalie. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, it has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how could we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father, and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak in my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. And we continue with our next song, Above All.
Well, grace and mercy and peace from God our Father and His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. No doubt you are all very tired of this initial topic. I am myself quite tired of it. Every company that I do business with, every advertisement I get, whether it's in the regular mail or by email, starts with this tiresome topic. Your news feed, whether you're watching your news on the internet or through regular television, all the political commentators, the daily speeches from the president and the governors and, and medical professionals, they're all talking about the topic of the day, the coronavirus. I'm tired of it. How has it been affecting you? Now, I'm not going to talk about the coronavirus itself really all that much, except to remind us that that's something the whole world is thinking about, the whole world is trying to deal with. And, and this virus that plagues the world is really cramping our style, let me tell you. And again, not something I have to tell you about or convince you of. It's made a lot of people sick. It's taken the lives, as of the time I wrote this message, about 260,000 people around the world. It's a very serious thing. But beyond the seriousness of it all, beyond the, the fact that um, this is something that the world's going to have to really deal with, it's also cutting into my lifestyle. Now, I know the congregation doesn't know me, but I haven't had a haircut in an awful long time, and I'm going to have to start getting a, uh, a rubber band here pretty soon. I don't think my hair's been this long since high school. I'm not really sure. It's uh, been a while. You know, but I, want to, I also want to meet the members of Bethany. I want to meet the members of the congregation. I want to have a have fellowship with you. I want to have communion. I want to offer communion to the people of God. I want to have Bible class. And I want to discuss the deep things of God with the people in the room. I want to talk about our living faith. I want to talk about searching together the, the scriptures of God and, and to reach out to the people of this congregation and the people of our community with the love of Jesus Christ. I want to play with my grandkids. And I want to forget some of the things I've had to learn, like PPEs and how to spell coronavirus. And I want to kind of distance myself from social distancing. And I tell you what, I'm kind of tired of Zoom meetings. Uh, every time we want to meet, we're meeting in front of a, a video camera and we're meeting in front of a video screen. All this COVID-19 stuff is on top of the regular stuff that we're dealing with day in and day out. Now, it may not have affected you, and, and uh, I can't say that it's affected me all that much, and I'm very blessed by this, but a lot of people have been downsized from their companies. They've been laid off for one reason or another. Again, as of the time I wrote these notes together, uh, the unemployment rate is upwards towards 22% across the nation. Some have lost their business. And then you, those who get sick, I did have family members who got sick and they weren't allowed into the medical facilities. They had to go through the virtual, through a, again, another screen, another camera to talk to the medical professionals at first. And then when they were admitted, the family couldn't visit them. It, this, this COVID stuff is really throwing a wrench in the whole thing. Well, my big thought today is, is to get down to the Word of God, is the question, where is God? Did we do something wrong? Is God upset that, uh, that all this is happening? Why is this happening to us? And, and are my prayers being heard? And are my prayers going to be answered? Now, you individually may not be struggling with this. But I can guarantee you, people in your family, your friends or the neighborhood, people you know are struggling with these kinds of questions. So how do we deal with it? Well, if you have these kinds of issues, if you have these kinds of questions that come up in your mind, I can tell you that you are in good company. Good and smart people have struggled with this for thousands of years. On the screen, you have one particular person. You might know him, the picture kind of have to guess who that is, but that's King David. And King David was a man, the scripture says King David was a man after God's own heart. God gave uh, David so many blessings and, and David loved God with his heart, soul, mind, and strength. If there's anybody on this planet that you would think that 
you know, he and David and God would get along. That's the, those two. And yet look what David wrote in this one psalm. And again, read through the psalms. You'll find out David had a lot of thoughts like this. We're in Psalm chapter 6. He says, Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I am faint. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. My soul is in deep anguish. And I love this line. How long, Lord? How long? And that's the question we kind of have during this corona thing. How long are we going to be uh, quarantined? And again, it's not the worst thing in the world, but it's also cramping our style. It's, uh, it's also frustrating not being able to get next to people and hug our family and friends, etc. Or another person from the, from the, again, another Old Testament person. There's another person that, that was just really connected with God. He loved God with his heart, soul, mind, and strength also. And God loved Job. And Job was one of those guys that God blessed abundantly because God, and again, God and Job really had this phenomenal connection. And yet this man of God, for a number of reasons, we'll have to have a sermon about that sometime, uh, had to go through a lot of turmoil. And what did Job, this great man of God, say? He said, do not, do not mortals have hard service on earth? Are not their days like those of a hired laborer? Like a slave longing for the evening shadow or a hired laborer waiting to be paid, so I have been allotted months of futility and nights of misery have been assigned to me. Now this is, a, again, people of God. These are people that love God and people that God obviously loves. Because in chapter 13 of the book of John, we have Jesus speaking with his disciples. And he's telling them, deep spiritual things he's saying to the disciples these are the remember these are the guys that walked with jesus literally walked with jesus for three years and he's beginning to tell them some very harsh realities regarding what's about to happen that he's going to be arrested he's going to be betrayed and then arrested he's going to be uh, uh, ultimately crucified he's going to die and he's speaking and that's in chapter 13 of john and then also in chapter 13 of John, he talks to this guy, one of the apostles named Peter. Now, I don't know if you know much about names, but Peter was named Peter because the word Peter in Greek means rock. And it's because Peter was the, was the rock of God. He was a man who was strong in his faith. And it's like nothing could shake that man. But Jesus even said to Peter, look, before the sun rises, you're going to want to distance yourself from me like like nobody's business you're going to deny you even know me and of course what do they say no it'll never happen i would never do such a thing and of course he did the disciples uh, were expecting certain things from jesus and certain things from god now i think i'll have to speak for myself but i think i'm, I'm not unusual that i expect certain things from god now, I, you know, it's a, it's, it's a bad joke, but if I ran the universe, right, if I ran the universe, I would run it differently. So we have to praise God around the world that I'm not running the universe. I understand that. But that's a normal thought for most of us. If I ran things, I would do things a little bit different than the way God does things. God's perspective is so much different than mine. And again, everybody should say praise God that it is different than than mine because my perspective is what I mean, you could guess without even knowing me that well my perspective is i'm number one <laughs> i uh, my thoughts are important and what i want in my life you know i would say i always i only want what i want when i want it it's all i want you know and that's just the way the human beings are and the disciples were you know they weren't necessarily exactly in that camp but they had a perspective of what god could be and what sh god should be and when Jesus says in, in uh, verse 4 of our text, you know the way to the place where I am going. And Thomas, I, got, I love Thomas. He's a very honest guy. He says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the ways? And so the, the disciples had this perception of God, and, and they grew up in the church. They grew up in the Jewish church. They went to Hebrew school. They understood the law of Moses, and they understood that God, through Moses, communicated to Israel and said, here's the Ten Commandments. Here's what I need from you. This, this is the way we are to live. And these guys, these disciples, they knew the Ten Commandments. They knew Moses. And they're thinking, well, I get this. We're, we're experts in law. I can, I can get that. But then Jesus 
perspective is a little bit different than that. It's bigger than merely obeying laws. And it's like they're scratching their head, like, well, I'm not sure I get it fully. They understood the Old Testament prophet's perspective. Every Old Testament prophet has a version of John, John the Baptist's uh, per, uh, preaching. Uh, he's the last of the Old Testament-style prophets, where he, we know the words in the New Testament, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And I think these apostles thought, yeah, I can tell people that. I can tell everybody they ought to repent. I get that. No, the, we have a perception of God. We have a perception of God that comes from a number of places. Sometimes it comes from the way we are brought up. We have the attitudes that our parents passed down or that the pastor taught us 40 or 50 years ago. And there's nothing wrong with that. We just say we have a perception of things. We have a perception of, of, of the, what we think God should be. I, 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 I'm going to remember the last name of the guy who wrote a book, uh, something effective, Your God is Too Small. I think his last name was Phillips. And so we, have, we, we tend to put God in a box. And we put God in the box because that way God is controllable and we can pull God out and say, well, God, I need you to perform here. I need you to do this. And, and God's perception is so much different than that. And praise God, it's so much better than that. After years of following Jesus, in their case, literally walking in the footsteps of Jesus, they're still scratching their heads at this point in history saying, I don't know where we're going. I don't know how to get from where I am to where you seem to be calling me. I don't know how to change my perception spiritually or emotionally and certainly not physically. And I don't know how to do that. So how can these disciples, and also us, how can we go from where we are to where Jesus wants us to be? How can we go from being being locked down COVID-19 pandemic victims, as an example, to be joy-filled, Christ-centered, engaged people of hope that God has called us to be? How can we be people who tend to focus on merely the here and now, who focus on what, you know, I focus on what I want and what I expect? How can we change? How can we move? How can we become a person who looks at bigger things and more important things and things from God's perception. Well, Natalie did in the children's message a pretty good job of that. Thank you, Natalie. They get the word of God. And we focus on what God's words are for us and God's words that, that remind us that we are logos-infused children of God. We need to be people who are, we even have the expression in, in our language, I'm going to be honest to God. You ever, you've heard that expression, obviously. I'm going to be honest to God. Well, I think that's what we ought to be. Let's be honest to God. And I think it's worthy to ask God the question, the question that Job asked, the question that David asked. It says, who are you, God? What are you saying to me? And then and, and change me, change my heart, change my attitude, change my mind that I might be receptive to hearing your voice and allowing you to work in my heart and work in my life. For most of the 2,000 years of the New Testament church, the church has had a, a, uh, a liturgical response called the curie. The curie is simply three sentences. And it goes, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. I always liked the curie. The curie is a prayer you pray when you don't know what to pray for. Lord, and the reason that's three is Lord meaning Father. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, and then Lord Spirit have mercy. That's the implication of the curie. The curie is the prayer you pray when you don't know what to pray for or you don't quite know how to pray, but you can pray the curie. Lord have mercy. We need to pray like King David did. We say, Lord, hear my prayer. Please listen to my pain. And be honest to God with our pain. And be honest to God with our doubts. And be honest to God with our confusion. And struggle with God until God wins that whole thing. To pray like Job. In the midst of the most horrible physical pain a person can go through, he is, he is standing before God. And Job says, I think it's very important for the Christians to understand this, Job says, Old Testament times, these words that you and I as in the Christian church know as an as a Easter hymn, I know that my Redeemer lives. And that in the end, 
uh, will, he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. And that's the faith of a man who is going through turmoil and pain and heartache where his own body was betraying him and all of his friends were accusing him of doing some horrible thing against God and against his family. And it was all a part of a, a master plan of God. But Job's faith responded to God and said, I don't understand, but I trust you. Now, I fully advocate that we should do everything we can to mitigate this coronavirus. We need to stay safe. We need to wear our, our personal protective equipment. And we need to listen to the medical experts. But when it comes to our spiritual life, we need to grasp onto God's perception of things, to understand God's viewpoint about what all is happening around us. We need to be reminded, remind one another, and be reminded ourselves that God is the God of life, that God is the God of creation. And he has called us, we read it in the epistle lesson, but he has called us to be his sons and daughters, a royal priesthood, to be this whole kingdom of priests. And he has breathed into us the very breath of life through his spirit. We need to be people who live by faith, not by fear, to embrace the fact that we are equally the children of God, whether we're worshiping him before a, a video screen, or whether we're standing before the altar of God, we are still the children of God and we're still the church of God, the praying, worshiping, loving, and serving church with God's message of hope and life and peace. We need to be people to understand that growing in faith, as we, and as we grow in faith, it's grasping more and more the perception of God. That during this pandemic, it is obvious that God is not bound to this building. He's not bound to any building. And during this pandemic, it's important for us to understand that God is not bound to our ways of doing things. He's not bound to our systems, and he's not bound to our formulas. Jesus said to his disciples, and he's saying to us today, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may also be where I am. We might say, Jesus, we might be like Thomas. We might be honest to God and say, Jesus, I don't understand exactly where you're going and I don't know how to get there. But understand this, that we're not, the church is not a system the church is not founded on principles or policies or rules or regulations. Christian, Christianity is not about having enough knowledge, but Christianity is a relationship with the person of Jesus Christ. God has offered himself. In these last days, he's shown himself to us through his son, Jesus Christ. It's a relationship with him. So talk to him. Share with him. Be honest to God. Tell him your hurts. Tell him your pain. But allow God to change your perception, to recognize that God has a way of doing things that are different than my ways or your ways. Regardless of whether we understand much about this coronavirus or anything else in life, we can know Jesus. We're in good hands, and we can trust him. And we can live our life and pray like David and like Job and like Peter, and Matthew, and Mary, and the billions of other Christians who have gone before us, where we can, as the old liturgy used to say, we, when we read, and mark, and learn, and inwardly digest the words that he has given to us, and we follow his words, when we hear his voice saying, truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. I am so looking forward to working with the people of Bethany Lutheran Church. I'm getting excited more and more each day to meet everybody, not just through a camera, but face to face. I'm looking forward to the day when again we can share the Eucharist 
and fellowship together and study the scriptures and to be about our Heavenly Father's business together. Until that day, we are still the church. We still carry the marks of the church of Jesus. Prayer and confession and hearing words of forgiveness. We have the scriptures. We have generosity. We are people of vision. We are the people of hope and the people of faith. We belong to Christ himself. And as a family, we also belong to one another. So may God richly bless each of you as we continue to celebrate Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. In the name of Jesus, amen. The Christian church has, for almost the full 2,000 years, had a confession, and it's a summary of the Christian faith. I invite you to confess with me the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Almighty God, with all of the creation, we want to give you thanks and praise for your gift, your gift that the whole world receives, the gifts of your sustaining life and life of all the living. Grant that seeing your even greater gift of deliverance from the disfigurement of sin and the promise of the renewal of your, your original design, that all people may come to repentance and faith in your gracious invitation through Jesus Christ risen and victorious over death. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayers. Give power to your word as it, it is proclaimed boldly by your church, filled with the Holy Spirit and the faithful witness of all, as it is preached and taught by all who are ordained and commissioned by you, as well as those to whom you have given the gifts to be fa a faithful witness of your salvation and your glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. Turn all the hearts of all who bear the authority of government in our land and around the world, that they may serve and lead all people in the ways of justice and peace and freedom. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. To all who suffer sickness or injury, we ask that you'd give comfort of your healing. And to all who suffer persecution for standing in the truth of the Christian faith, give strength to endure. To all, increase faith and faithfulness, believing that the risen Christ leads us to the glory of eternal life in your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. Be with the people of Bethany Lutheran Church. Allow us, as we begin this journey together, to be able to please you in all that we do. Allow us, by your grace, to be a church that is so focused on who you are and what you've done that like it says in the scriptures, we cannot help but speak of the things which we have seen and heard. I pray that you would bless every member of this congregation and everybody watching this YouTube video and everybody that, uh, that we come across, that you would bless everyone with the gospel message that comes from our lips and allow us to be the people of peace. Allow us to be people who cannot help but share the good news of Jesus Christ, crucified but also risen again. Lord, I pray for all those who are who have and, and might yet lose their jobs and their businesses. I pray, Lord, that your divine perception would be perceived by all. I pray that we would be able to, by your grace as a church and, and the Christian church throughout the world, help those who need help so desperately. Allow us to be the hand of Christ that, that serves and gives and helps. Allow us to see clearly the, the plan that you have for our congregation and for the whole Christian church. Allow us to see that plan and have faith to jump into the midst of that plan and accomplish your will, your ways. Lord Jesus, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord Jesus, we give you all glory and thanks and praise. 
And as we together pray once again, we want to pray uh, the, your prayer that you caught your disciples as together we say, Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come. come. Thy, thy will be done, done on earth as it as is in is heaven. heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, bread and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as, as we forgive, forgive those who trespass, trespass against us. us. And lead us not into temptation, temptation, but deliver us from from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Justified, freely forever. One day he's coming.